I'm Vicki Hogarth and welcome to Southwest Magazine. Neighborhood Works is one of the most important nonprofits in our community, providing care to some of our most vulnerable citizens. And today I am joined by Executive Director of Neighborhood Works, Jim Stewart. Jim, thank you so much for sitting down with me today. Well, thank you for having me. I want to start off by talking about, I know a lot of people in St. Stephen area and beyond know Neighborhood Works from the community dinners that you put on so regularly and are, are such a special thing in the community and have actually inspired so many other groups in neighboring communities to do similar things. But for the last two years, you've also taken on the role of operating warming stations in our community, which have become even more critically needed due to the large number of people without homes uh, in Charlotte County and St. Stephen in particular. How did this role fall on Neighborhood Works and uh, how are you managing to take on that extra responsibility? So, yeah, it's a, it has been really great to put it, you know, we've got lots of people in the community, but how it started was that um, we started having our suppers, um, got to know some of our um, unsheltered, our homeless individuals. Um, and then through another process, we wanted a, the, there was a large working group, sorry, there was a large working group that was part of the town and a bunch of lots of people that were trying to figure out what could be done with some of our homeless um, and how we could um, positive, make positive change. So we uh, uh, got to know them. We did a survey. They were, because everyone needs to know that the only way people move forward is through relationship building, making connections, and we were able to make those connections. And I, not we, I wasn't really part of that, but our, our staff at the, the dinners, and we were able to do a really good survey around the needs of individuals. Um, so we continued on that kind of large working group, just sitting on the peripheral a little bit. Um, and then um, when the warming center was announced that it, we, going to pretty much go ahead and that would have been probably the first of November of 22 mm -hmm. um, and they needed wanted a nonprofit to run it and and asked us there was a couple of members um, on that committee that asked us to run it so that's that's how we got into it wasn't really our mandate at the time we're proud we're pleased we're so happy we were able to do that um, regardless of the challenges I believe it saved lives last year so and that's, that was the location uh, right behind the thrift shop Correct, the old okay. du the yeah. old uh, dually, so what they call the green room, yes, yes. Can we talk a little bit about why that ended at that location and uh, where you found yourself last summer with that, knowing right. that there wasn't right. a warming stencher planned for 2023, 2024 winter? Right, so when we started, when we really moved into that place, we knew it was gonna be temporary. Um, it wasn't gonna be a long space. It, the, um, it was located in not a great space. If you stepped out, no matter where you stepped out, you were right on the sidewalk or on somebody else's property. Um, and um, let alone it didn't have one window in it. So it didn't make it very inviting, even though yes, it's an overnight. Might have, people might say it made it conducive for sleeping, but it didn't make it conducive for living, if you want to say, because there was, there was no lights at all. Um, so, and <clears throat> so we knew that wasn't going to be long term. Fortunately, um, we were able to have a, a, a gentleman and a few other volunteers that we were able to provide breakfast every morning. So we were able to move them out of that space, uh, take them up to 59 Union Street. They'd have breakfast. Some people could have showers, do laundry, and then then kind of go on their, their day. Um, so that's how we got to that. So then... Um, come probably July, um, we never heard of anything happening again for this year. Uh, no one came to us, government or otherwise, <clears throat> excuse me, not that they should have, came to us to ask what's happening and we knew something had to happen. Mm -hmm. um, so again, there's about four or five, six like-minded individuals sat down um, and said, what can we do? So we developed a criterion 
I want to say criteria, but I learned it as criterion. Um, and we developed a criterion, some that had what are negotiables and what are non-negotiables for both the, those that were homeless and those in our community. So we'll just say one of the negotiables were laundry. Mm -hmm. If we can't have laundry, we'll figure that out. Another negotiable was, or non-negotiable was, it had to be in, within walking distance of amenities. And part of that also had to have, how can we have the minimum effect on a community as possible? Um, now, we're not gonna have no effect, um, because no matter where we go, there's gonna be a larger presence um, of individuals, and sometimes that's, that's uh, scary, um, um, and you know, concerning for, for others, and, and we understand that. Mm -hmm. However, all these same people are in our community right now, um, so it, it just takes some, I guess, finesse on how do you balance out those sort of things. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the comments that I see online um, when we're talking about the local homeless population, and I'd love since you uh, know them so well, um, have faces to put and names to put to people. Um, people like to think they're not from our community, that somehow maybe they've been bussed in. Um, can you talk a little bit about who these, now we believe it's around 70 to 100 uh, homeless people, can we talk about what is the number and do you find they're generally from our region? So I can go by the number we had last year and, yeah. and, and 67 distinct individuals that use the warming center were from Charlotte County. 90% from St. Stephen and the outlying area. Mm -hmm. I don't know, you know, and people have talked to me, what constitutes being from St. Stephen. Some people suggested that they're bust in, we give them a St. Stephen ID, I've never heard of one, and then they go about saying, I don't know, have, if I lived here for five years and became homeless, would I be from St. Stephen? Right. I know there's a lot of times where we never feel we've lived there, even though we've been there for 40 years. People say, well, I've never, you know, I'm never, this isn't my home, it's somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Or people will say, you're not from here. So um, is that, those are the questions I think we have to have. But mm -hmm. I would say, again, 90% of the individuals I've encountered are residents of St. Stephen and Charlotte County. Mm -hmm. And I and most of them have been here pretty much their whole lives. I think too when you're able to go to the community dinners at Neighborhood Works, um, and it's a mix of the whole community, but when you're also able to meet people who are in that situation, uh, it can make it more real, help with your empathy to find a solution, because as you said, no solutions going to be perfect. Someone will always find it, uh, um, maybe upsets their regular routine, um, perhaps their, their property in some kind of way, um, but it's not going to be perfect. So when you were making this criteria, was that prior to the mayor declared a state of emergency yes, in we, December? Yes, we, we started working that. on this in, in August. Um, yes, yeah, so if we back up a little bit, sorry about that. Yeah, so we started working on this really on August. Mm -hmm. We developed our criteria. We looked at a number of different properties, um, you know, whether it's zoning, whether it's proximity, whatever the case might be, we looked at all of that. And on, uh, in October, we went to town council, which again, that was a closed meeting, we asked not the town. We asked to have a closed meeting because of the confidentiality, not again that we didn't want anyone to know where it was, because um, that's a misconception, but we're not, and I want people to know that, that we weren't going to announce anything until we knew it could happen. Mm -hmm. So we took the plan to council in October. They, I won't speak for them, but they seemed supportive of what it was. We needed to go back. Um, to the province, find out whether that land could be used. Of course, we all know there was some stuff going back and forth, um, but I will speak for ourselves again that uh, then it was on January the 10th, which was a Wednesday, we found out by all technical um, reasons it now could be used. Okay, and this is the Happy Valley this is Road. A, this would be the property at Happy Valley Road, yes, yes. So that's that's where we, got to at that point. Okay, so the plan for Happy Valley Road even predates 
um, the declaration of the state of emergency. It was something that, that your group was that working is correct. on prior that is to correct. that. So our response to the declaration of emergency uh, was that we contacted the mayor and said we'll figure out a way to have a 24-hour drop-in center um, because, at Union, right, at, at, at 59 Union, works. where it is right now, and the reasoning was, well, not the reason, the reason was we need to get people in. Um, I went to my board and my board unanimously said, yes, we have to do mm -hmm. that. Um, so we opened it, unfortunately, with with sleeping accommodations or even sleeping, there's, a, you, there's regulations that you fall under. Yeah. Um, we were hopeful at the time that a drop-in was going to be very temporary. Mm -hmm. um, not as long as it is right now, but this is where we're at. Um, so we, we continue or continue to do that just because people need a place to be. Mm -hmm. And our numbers have risen to, I think the night before last, of 18 individuals. Wow. Um, which we would have last year at a 15-bed facility had to turn people away. And mm -hmm. last night was, I think, our coldest night we've had. So we're, we're thankful that we can't do that or that we were able to do that. But again, people cannot sleep and you can't go forever without sleeping, mm -hmm. right? You get irritable. We all get irritable, right? Mm -hmm. and, and my fear is that we get irritable and something happens and again, we blame it on the drugs. Right, but if you can't lie down right. and you do have addiction yep. issues, I think that Yep. That could instigate someone to maybe use more well, at the time just well, to get we through snap, the night. Right? We all do. I mean, you talk about mothers or anyone, and I'm not comparing, and that's the problem that I find in, in making an analogy. People think I'm comparing if I said someone who has cancer, right? Oh, so you're comparing someone with cancer to someone's home. That's not what I'm trying to do. I'm just mm -hmm. trying to make a comparison. But if a mom can never sleep with their with their three-year-old who's colicky and doesn't get a little help with that, someone coming in to sit or whatever, you know, she's not the best mom she can be. She mm -hmm. knows that, right? So the same way with our people, um, you know, you get irritable, you know, perhaps you're trying to sleep and someone's pacing the floor and now you're getting mad at them and there's, you know, there can be some conflict that you have to navigate and that's, you know, but all of that really comes down to not sleeping. Mm -hmm. And Happy Valley Road, if it's able to happen, I think there's still a possibility that it could. Um, it would be end of February still, which is late, but at least it's this winter. And it, I know it's meant to be a temporary few year solution until you can work with the town and the province to build something right. more so, permanent. So for me, when we proposed Happy Valley, it would have had sleeping arrangements. It would have been staffed 24 hours. Um, I'm not I'm not talking saying that it can or can't go. That's that's mm -hmm. outside my my pay grade, let's say. Yeah. Um, um, but that was that would have been the goal and it would have been a 24 hour so people could come in to get showers. Um, there was no laundry, so we'd have to do something else for laundry, but they could get showers. They could come in doing day program. And part of that supportive piece that would have gone the, on there is having mental health mm -hmm. come out in the building. No, they're not going to sit there all day long, but they could. we could set up times for them. The, we would have case managers there that would help move people. You know, we have outreach now, right? We mm -hmm. have two outreach workers now, which is great. Um, um, and our first um, point of contact, it should be our outreach. Now, sometimes it's because they're coming in at night, so the next morning we introduce them to our outreach. An outreach goal is automatically, as all of our goals need to be, and this is where we're headed, housing. Mm -hmm. How do we get you a house? That has to be the automatic question, not why you're here, not what happened, mm -hmm. we'll get your immediate needs here, you know, get yourself warm, get fed. Okay, why, why are you not housed? Right. Some of it may be chronic, some of it might be my landlord evicted me. Mm -hmm. And in some cases, we have individuals that don't know when you're given an eviction, they think they're out right now. Mm -hmm. And so our outreach has been able to, <clears throat> excuse me, work with landlords 
and say, okay, well, he, he's out at the end of the month. Mm -hmm. And it might be reasons because the building was sold, as we know, yep. and that happens, and we now how do we find someone else another place to live? Mm -hmm. Because if you're already housed currently, it's easier to get you housed. So we have to triage that as well. Mm -hmm. Now, maybe it's a case where that individual isn't keeping his apartment up to clean. Right, or maybe he's got too many people coming and going as far as the landlord is concerned or the lease is concerned. So that would be then the outreach workers to work with that individual landlord, how do we clean this up? And maybe then a support staff then will go in and make sure every week that things are done, have a meeting with the landlord, you know, those sort of things. Now that's very basic and probably kind of pie in the sky, but those are some of the things that could and can happen to keep someone housed. Mm -hmm. But the focus has to be housing. Right. So if they're not and they have to come into the center, whether drop in, warming or what, the goal has to be, how do we get you housed, right? Mm -hmm. How do we get you into a place? And, and a lot of it's gonna to have to be supportive because a lot of these gentlemen don't know how to, have, have lost the skills for living mm -hmm. in those kind of spaces that we take for granted. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's, that's the work that has to be ongoing um, once we get people in a spot where we can build those connections, build trust, and move them forward. Mm -hmm. So, um, I think I've been privileged to know you a long time. So I've seen the work you do in action, and it is uh, beyond inspiring. And you are a true gift, and your whole staff uh, and volunteers just a gift to the community. Uh, I know there's so many factors right now that you know we get asked a lot. Why? Why is this? Why are there so many homeless people in St. Stephen? And there are many factors. We know um, people outside the province buying up a lot of buildings that get boarded up that used to be affordable housing. It's just one factor of, we know meth use in COVID. Um, Diane Kearns from Avenue B was saying, um, you know, when they shut the borders and drug flow stopped, meth is cheap and can be produced anywhere. And suddenly New Brunswick had a meth crisis like we never had before. Um, and meth is just so devastating on its effect on individuals and just how addictive it can be too. Um, you throw in inflation and all these factors that make uh, finding a place that's affordable uh, in St. Stephen um, and throw in addiction issues together, the complicated place we're at right now um, and why this need is so critical when we have these plummeting temperatures this time of year to, to get people off the streets. Now I know with the province, a press release for the Happy Valley location went out prior to your chance to speak with the neighbors. Right. Did that have an impact on whether this location could go forward? I know that that wasn't yep. the intention to put it out publicly before yeah. the neighbors so were spoken I, to. I guess if we if we speak to that the same way as we had, if you want to say, the, and we did, the closed session with the uh, municipality, because an, as an agency and as a working group, we did not want to put anything out there that we didn't know was viable, right? So we had a what we thought was a great, we still think is a great plan. Um, it's a viable plan. Nothing is ever gonna be perfect. N no one, we're not gonna please everybody no matter what we do. Um, so once that happened and we got the go ahead, um, I think part of the issue, part of the upheaval too was um, the way it was, we can use this land, we asked for the land, no, we can't use this land, it's this, it's that, and people got a lot of concerns, well, why can't you, and now why are you doing this, and why wasn't it done before, and, and all of those things, and I'm not answering, I can't answer any of those, I just know from an agency point of view that once, like I said, on that Wednesday, that we were told that the land was usable, we went back to all of the town council along with the province and neighborhood works and had a discussion about moving forward. And the next plan should have been, from our perspective, we wanted to do a door to door, right? We wanted to go door to door um, and get everyone's concerns and feedback and, and all of that. So again, with the way it happened in the press release, um, those things happen, can't go backwards. Um, it was, a, it was a, a meeting for those people that were concerned. So 
Again, people talk about whether media couldn't come in, it was a closed meeting. Again, part of that I will would be on neighborhood works as the individuals that were gonna operate it and we wanted one-on-one -on -one conversations. So that was kind of our door-to-door -door, and we wouldn't be taking media with us door-to-door, -door, right? Mm -hmm. If afterwards this was completely unacceptable to those that were there and the neighbors and businesses and they decided look we need to have a community meeting we need to get together that's totally within the right what they did as well is totally within the right not saying that I'm just saying from our perspective this was our door-to-door -door, mm -hmm. supposed to be a bit more intimate uh, you know get feedback back and forth <clears throat> so that's where that came about and then you know then the pause mm -hmm. and I know the premier was here on Monday with Minister Baucus they met with you does it feel like there is hope for something this year what what can we expect I mean it's still as you said the February is upon us and this is the coldest month yeah. so <clears throat> They, I have, and I gotta, I gotta say this too, especially with our community of volunteers, of people that have been donating, people that have been so giving, uh, time, um, you know, making meals for, come in with hot meals on a regular daily basis, right? And that's from St. Stephen to, to St. Andrews, people are doing that. Um, we feel so supported by our community um, I know we tend to focus on negative, but we, we feel so supported by the community at large. Um, and we've always felt supported by the municipality. We've always felt supported by our MLA, our local MLA. Um, they've always expressed it and, and tried to do stuff for us. Um, I feel we've always been supported by uh, those, if you wanna say the civil servants that do the work for social development and the province have always been supportive. Um, the problem is, uh, you know, or I guess where we're at right now is we don't know where we're at right now. Um, we as an agency and as a group submitted a proposal. That's the proposal we gave. We weren't gonna have six different proposals so we could fight over six different places. And we didn't have that anyway. We didn't have the luxury of having that. If we did, we'd be throwing another one out now and one out the next day. We, we didn't have that luxury. So, so we have, for all accounts, the job that we tax, tasked ourselves with, we've done. Mm -hmm. We put it forward. Um, we have, as far as to our best of our ability, have answered the questions from those that were on Happy Valley Road. Mm -hmm. Again, I'm not speaking for them, I'm only speaking for us, and, and uh, um, I'm not sure where that that is. Um, <clears throat> so we've heard their concerns, we gave back what we thought was, you know, was able to mitigate most of those. I think some of their major concerns around um, and I don't want to call them what ifs, but to me it's like, what if this happens? What if that happens? You know, what if my insurance goes up? I don't have answers for them. Um, you know, if uh, someone breaks in and your insurance goes up because of, of that, you know, I, I don't have answers for that. Of course, I don't know anyone who's going to say, I'm going to pay for that. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's kind of assurance that they want. Uh, or reassurance that they want, um, but I don't want to speak for them either. This is just assumptions that I that I'm making. But I think once um, I think now that we've done that, and and I know I didn't answer any questions about the premier. I felt supported by the premier. There was nothing definitely decided mm. in that meeting, but I do feel. And, I, and it felt very genuine, and I've never met the man, but he's, it felt very genuine that he wants to help St. Stephen, mm -hmm. right? He wants to do something about this. And, and that's really all I can say. I, he can't wave a, wave a magic wand either. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know whether in consultations they're having more talks about whether it's Happy Valley or about what else do we do from here, here's another suggestion, that sort of thing. But if there are any, 
Um, certainly, I know that the province will announce them, but if we have anything else to announce, we certainly will as well. Mm -hmm. um, but our, our focus now is to keep those that are unsheltered and give them a place to sleep. So we're in the works of trying to um, work with the powers that be, whether it's we have to have an engineering site plan and send it off to the fire marshal's office to see if beds are allowed, distances, how many can go in there. So that's that's our next goal to, to get people sleep because we're not moving. Mm -hmm. We were hoping to be moved forward by now mm -hmm. and we didn't. Um, but one other thing that I'd like to talk about and that is those people, right? And I'm glad the word most people say in those people at least is the word people. Yeah. Um, because I think we have to establish, first of all, that we are dealing with people. Behaviors, addictions, all of that is different than a person, right? So we gotta look at and have that person first in mind. And what does what are the rights of people, right? People have certain rights, and whether that's safe drinking water, you know, we can look at the human charter, we can look at the NB charter, we can look at the Canadian Charter of Rights, and there's certain rights that people have a right to. Um, so, you know, there are people that may say, well, you're on drugs, you can't make those decisions, or the case, you know, um, but we also have people that until with dementia and until it has been determined, not by the general population, not by the next door neighbor, mm -hmm. but by a legitimate medical body, says this person can no longer take care of themselves, something has to take place. If that is done, then, then that's what has to be done. But for us to sit in judgment and say, yes, you're not making decisions for yourself, Right? You're not making the right decisions. I agree, but that's not for me to change in that way. For me and for us, it's to provide a space where you can be, if we can get rid of where do I sleep and if I get something to eat, then maybe we can start working on those other issues. But they're not gonna be worked on if all you are is in survival mode wanting where am I going to be tonight? And some of it might be, yes, my next place, but not everybody out there is a drug addict, right? Some people have some severe mental health issues from trauma and abuse that they went through at a young age. We have people in this community that were in King's Clear at seven, nine, 12 years old and sexually abused and are now addicts. If we seen that seven year old, we wouldn't be thinking the same way as we do about maybe that 50 year old. But nothing's helped that person, right? So housing, food, make connections, and let's work people through it. Housing has to come first, and that's, and that's where we're looking at, that's where the province is looking at. All the models that we have uh, looked at whether being going to Niagara, whether it's the Finnish model, the Denmark model, it's all about low, no barrier housing. Get person's house, support them while they're there. You can still be an addict, a using addict and still be housed and you can be successful. But we can also work with those once we get to that point that you're housed and you can start thinking a little bit more clearly that it isn't just about the next fix, the next meal, what I'm gonna do, then we can help them if they wanna go into recovery, right? Um, that's, that's, where, that's where we want to go, um, you know, and, and I think that's where we need to go. Um, from all the accounts, again, I don't pretend to be the expert. I know what I've learned over the last year and a half, um, and I'm, I'm proud, pleased of Neighborhood Works and the job that we're doing, and uh, we see the differences in, in a lot of people. You may not, you know, most people don't know that six of our homeless from last year are now housed. There's as many that is in, gone to treatment and in recovery, 
And that is really a direct result of the suppers we had and because we, we the proverbial we, my, you know, the volunteers and the, uh, the other staff and our outreach workers got to know people and they came to us looking where, how can I better myself? What is the next step? How can I, I don't want to live this way. And we hear that all the time. I don't want to live this way. But if you're not right there at that moment and be able to move quickly, we don't get moved because then the need for sleep or drugs mm. or alcohol or just, it goes, right? I need help right then and if we don't have it right then. And it takes a lot. It takes a lot. I don't know how people move out of addictions from what I've seen if there is no support. Right. People have done it. Mm -hmm. I don't know how they do it. Because, you know, we've been involved with a couple of individuals that it was, I don't even know how to navigate it, right? It took three of us and him still willing mm -hmm. to, to get there, so. I think uh, because you and Neighborhood Works are the ones stepping up to the plate, you also are the ones that take the heat from the community too when they're dissatisfied with the solutions or what's in front of them but I just want to express gratitude for the work you do, um, you and your team, because I don't know how we'd be navigating this challenging time without you and even with Happy Valley Road, is it on pause? We don't know. You are also the one coming up with the most immediate solution, temporary as it may be, to, to get through this winter because otherwise it's going to be minus 10 for a while now. So. I hope you can feel it when I say uh, no. my gratitude, not just mine, but I think on behalf of all the community that really recognizes uh, the work you do, thank you so much. Well, and I, I appreciate that. Um, and there's lots of people, it's not just me, mm -hmm. as we know, and there's lots of people that volunteer and there's lots of people that work for our organization that does six different jobs in order to make some of this happen. Um, um, but I do think, you know, I think one, and it may be a little bit negative to leave it on, um, but I do think we have to talk about winners and losers. Um, and I know for the, the, for the people on Happy Valley Road not having it there and it on pause is, you know, um, and, you know, as described as a win. Mm -hmm, I and I and I understand, you know, like it's probably, you know, this is a stressor off of me because it is, it does cause stress to a community, that sort of thing. So, and I take nothing away from that. I just, when I hear that, if there's winners and losers, who lost? I didn't lose. I went home to bed, right? Might not have slept that well, but I still went home to bed. So. There was only one loser or one group of losers in that and they're the same people that we're still trying to serve. So that's, I think, not see it as winning or losing because as a community, and I, and I, I, I see this from, from this community for the last 40 years that I've been in this community that we have been very resilient, that we have taken on challenges. We have been um, pilot projects for a lot of different programs. And I look at the, at the integrated service delivery for one, and now it's throughout the entire province, right? So, so we are, we can affect change, absolutely. We have wonderful people. But if we, again, we have to see people as people. We have to get past their behaviors. We can deal with behaviors on a different level, whether it's, if it's, if it's addictions, then let's try to move them towards that. If it is, if it's mental health, let's try to move them towards that kind of a resolve. If it's criminality, then we have to move towards the justice system, right? Um, but we can't, and this has been suggested, that the way to solve this is to take people, all the people that we think 
that are addicts or are homeless and put them somewhere else outside of town, not around people, okay? Well, one thing is, from my perspective, and I know little, I'm not a historian, but by my perspective, anytime we picked up a group of people and moved them somewhere they didn't want to be, it never worked out well for anybody. Mm -hmm. So let's just say that we do that. We spend thousands of dollars developing nice resource outside of town, whatever the case might be, and nobody wants to go. We still have the same problem in town. The other thing is it's illegal and immoral because if all you have is your feet, you can't leave when you want to, right? Mm -hmm. You are stuck there and people might say, well, we'll put a bus. So when do we put the bus on every hour? every half hour, like how, how do we do that? And if I want to leave, I can't. So again, not saying Graham and Ann is a, a place where there's all kinds of addicts, but, but if we look at Graham and Ann, when they became part of New Brunswick, Canada, they were guaranteed a service on and off the island, right? And they've got that. And people live over there knowing that that's the service. They choose to live under those conditions. Right? But if I was to take you and drop you off on Graham and Ann and you don't want to be there, you can't get off when you don't want to or when you want to. Therefore, you are held against your will and it is against the law under all of our charters to take away the will of someone, and particularly the will of movement. So, let alone unethical, immoral, we can't do that to people, and what services would they then get further out of town? How do they get back in if it's just methadone they need? Mm. Right, we just have a box of methadone. Maybe we bring everyone in at eight o'clock in the morning and drop them off on Front Street. I don't think people would be happy about that either, and we pick them up at eight o'clock and take them back out, mm. right? If we're crying about the lack of services, and people do, and, and I disagree with some of it because there are services if we, were, if we are willing to use those services, do we need more? We're always going to need more, right? It's like someone who gets a raise. I've never heard anyone ever say they get paid too much, right? Like you don't, right? You're always, you, you, it's just nature. But anyway, so then how do we get those services if they're away somewhere? So are we now busing out clinicians? Do we set up a great big compound out in the woods somewhere where you as a psychiatrist come in once a week? And I mean, we did those, we called them center care and mental institutions and they didn't work either. They were, they were shut down because we were just housing people. We don't wanna house people. We wanna, we wanna move people forward and not move them on. And that's another point that I try to make about a security. People say we need security, we need security. We may need some law enforcement for criminal activity. That's different than security. What is a security person going to do other than move, move, mm -hmm. move? There's no relation, in most cases, there's no relationship building. But if that person doesn't want to move, what is their recourse? they usually will have to involve law, and the law moves them. So, and I'm not taking away from security, they, they certainly have a place in a lot of places, keeping places safe. However, for the people that we want to serve, give us more outreach or caseworkers or counselors that can move people forward and not move them on, that can work with them, can develop relationships, can get them in a place, and, and again, I'm not saying, and I don't believe that every addict, and we're all addicts, I think, in some ways, that, that every addict is, is gonna be clean, but they can still have a good life and get the basic needs. Mm -hmm. But if they choose, and we know that, I know this from big cities, people will not go to centers they need to be almost in their corner, making sure they know everything that's coming around them so they're safe. That's the only way they feel safe. And we may have some of those people. That's a choice. But if we have nothing to offer them, there is no choice. 
And, I, and you know, I use the adage of, adage, if you lead a horse to water, you can't make them drink. And that's true. If you send someone to therapy and they don't want to be there, it's not going to happen. You send them to mental health for therapy or whatever, it's not going to help. But what I also say is you need to leave the bucket there long enough till they're thirsty. And that's the connections and the relationship building that you need to make that person thirsty to move forward. And you've seen it. You've seen it in our community. And yes. I think that maybe that doesn't get stressed enough. You mentioned earlier in the show how many people you've seen in recent history in our community yep. not just get back on their feet, but succeed. Yeah, and people that are now housed that weren't housed and staying housed. You know, and, and, and again, you, you, I guess we have to look at, and, and some people will say that, I don't want to help the addicts. I only want to help those that are truly unhoused. I don't know what that is, right? I, I, I don't, I, you know, like people want to say 70, 30 or whatever. You're just down on your luck. Well, those people are going to be easy to house if we have housing, right? So that's probably a, a housing issue, not someone who cannot be housed because of other concerns, mm -hmm. right? That's a different kind of kettle of fish. But then I don't know how you make a distinction. So are we, in order to service someone, and I know this is gonna sound way out there, but yeah. if we take it to kind of, you know, they can't make their own decisions. We have to make them for them. We don't wanna help addicts. We only wanna help these people. So now do we drug test everyone mm -hmm. who is, and do we decide which addict are you? So if you had a major back injury and you're on prescription drugs and addicted to prescription drugs, is that the same thing as someone on meth, right? Then who makes those distinctions? Because if it's the same people that want to put people out in the woods or want them out of town, out of sight, I don't want them making the dis those distinctions either. So that's why I say we need it. There's a people, mm -hmm. people first, housing first, then we move forward. Mm -hmm. And there are, I personally know many people in our community in long-term recovery. So I always, when I hear the um, stigma against addiction, uh, it can hurt because to know so many amazing uh, members of our community who are in long-term recovery, I think it must hurt for all of them to hear that distinction being made towards addiction because anyone who's in long-term recovery has been rock bottom yep. at one point. And just because you're out of it doesn't mean you don't relate to that person who was an addict and right. know what they went through. Um, and I think for me, when we have those conversations and I hear people talk so negatively about addiction, I can't imagine what that does to the stigma not just for those who've made it out of addiction, but for those considering um, getting better. Because you, you do have to hit rock bottom before you're ready to get help. But if yep. they hear that the community feels that they're not worthy of support, um, then that makes it all the more challenging to say, oh, I'm ready to get clean. Because I think you would, I think I know that you would always feel that judgment no yep. matter how how much success you had in sobriety, you'd know that that was the feeling your community had towards addiction and your, your worthiness of getting help, that somehow you wouldn't be worth it. And that is a, definitely a hard thing to, to uh, hear regularly right. right now. And those are the things that add to trauma, right? And I, I you know, so, you know, some of these things happen, whether, you know, whether it's physical abuse or sexual abuse and, right, and people don't necessarily get the proper help or it's all denied or it's blocked and, 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 and that trauma comes back. And sometimes the same way as your pain medication that you abuse, then you, you have to self-medicate for the pain mm -hmm. that's mental, mm -hmm. right? It, to me, it's the same thing, right? It's, it, it's, and I'm no expert, so I'm just, you know, we all self-medicate. 
I used to self-medicate with food. I used to self-medicate with, with other things but when I was younger, but because we don't necessarily maybe like ourselves mm -hmm. or, or like where we came from or like what we had. And then when people again bring up that so-and-so from down the road and none of them turned out to be anything, right? No matter how well he's done, adds, continues to add to that trauma. Mm -hmm. and, and almost every person that's addicted to something mm -hmm. you're gonna find is based on a trauma, mm -hmm. right? And, and those traumas have not been dealt with but we can, we can certainly move forward and the listening, and again, I say, and, and people talk about the suppers and they'll say, our suppers, the supper have anything with, with solving food inequity? No, it doesn't. Maybe it gives you as a family one more meal that you don't have to pay that and that you can't afford that week, and that's great. But what it really does and what we've really seen it do is one, there's a big sense of community and fellowship within some of the people that are coming, whether it's from a seniors building, from a church organization. But the major impact has been those that we talk about right now that we want to serve, that they trust us, right? They trust that what we say we are going to do and that is another reason why I will not announce anything until it's there. These people have been mis mis they're disenfranchised so many times by we're going to do, we're going to do. Um, they're surveyed out of all the people that come in and say, oh, well, this will help us what you're going to use, what you're going to need, mm -hmm. right? They continue to do it. Mm -hmm. They do it over and over again. Nothing happens in their mind, yeah. right? And, and, and they have... They have uh, certainly good evidence based on that. So again, that is why, you know, people can say you're transparent, you're not being transparent, you're not whatever, you know, it's going to fail no matter what because you didn't announce it and it's going to fail because you did announce it. But the main reason is that we are not going to give false hope mm -hmm. to those that are already hopeless. It's not fair. I was talking to Darren Burns in December. Yes. Um, who lives on the streets of St. Stephen. He was in part of the Sweeney building for a, a yep. while and might still be there. Um, and he said, what you're saying, um, cause people ask me sometimes when I say it's 70 to 100, I knew it was 67 from the working yep. group, homeless people yep. from last year. Um, then the town estimated 70 this year. And Darren Burns, who lives on the streets, told me 102 was their own head count. Um, and I take his number the most seriously uh, because he's there counting his yep. friends uh, who are also living on the streets. What is it like from the perspective of people who don't have a home that you talk to regularly? They obviously know these discussions are going on in the community. Um, how are they feeling hearing what they're obviously hearing about at least our indecision on a path to move forward? Well, when, uh, when we had the last meeting at the Garceland Center with the neighbors, I left there and went back to the center and they knew before I got there. And it was another no-go, they said. Um, you hear a lot of, of, I can't even I don't dare take my backpack with me because I'm scared either I'm going to be beat up, I won't be allowed in, or name calling, that sort of thing. Um, so it is, it is devastating and again it perpetuates that I'm no good for nothing and a lot of times that's part of the pain and I'm not making excuses so I don't you know I don't want people to think so but realistically um, that adds to no good for nothing it adds for their feeling uh, again of worthless and that doesn't help people get out of where they're at that kind of language keep people there we know that from anyone who has been in an abusive relationship 
that we keep putting you down and keep putting you down to keep you there. It isn't until someone shows you the difference that you're able to move away from that, right? And, and again, I want people to understand that I'm not saying an abused woman is like an, a homeless addict. I'm not saying, I'm just saying the, the principles can be the same. We can cross those principles over from one genre, if you want to say, to another. People are feeling desperate. Um, you know, when we did our last survey and we asked about if they're, this is way back in October about a warming center, and some said that they would commit crimes so they could get locked up. And if it's a bad enough crime, they can get locked up for two years, right? At least they eat and they're warm and, and that sort of thing. Um, and, and I know people, you know, it's, it's easy for people to say, well, then just stop doing what you're doing. I smoked, took a long time to stop doing what I was doing. I ate, wasn't healthy, it took a long time to stop doing those sort of things, right? And they're not, you know, some of them are chemical, but they're not the same chemical as it is when we, we do drugs, mm -hmm. or even alcohol, mm -hmm. or even prescriptions, or sugar. <laughs> like, I just, you know, there's just so many that I, I want to get back to the people part of it. Mm -hmm. We need to see people and what needs they have and is there anything that we can do to change that. I just decided when we were filming this, we're just gonna keep rolling because I think this conversation was so necessary um, for our community right now um, and everything that we are navigating to, to have this go as, as long as it needed to be. Um, are there any final thoughts, Jim, that you want to leave people at home with? Um, well, our, uh, and the, the last thing is, you know, um, is really to that we we need to get people sleeping, and that's that's our next goal. Um, regardless what's decided on, it, it, whether it's Happy Valley Road, whether it's another piece of property, whatever it is, um, our goal has been and continues to be a long-term solution to housing. Um, the first step, of course, is you've got to triage that and get people off the street and get them warm and get them in a place where they are better to be assisted. And then, again, triage those and move them into housing as quickly as possible. The longer statistics show, the longer that people stay in shelters and in warming centers, the less likely they are to move out from that. Um, so that's why for us it's around housing. Um, you know, it's wonderful what a lot of other communities are doing. I mean, even with Miramichi and even with Nova Scotia and whether it's Pelotons, whether it's, you know, um, Moncton where they've got a nice working farm for people, they're learning skills. Um, you know, all those tiny homes, whatever. Um, but for us, it's what does housing going to look like? Where's the money going to come from? Um, and I know that the province is committed to some of that, but I also know that we are a small province. We have limited, limited amount of funds and everyone has their hands out. Um, and so our goal on that would be is to hopefully, um, I think we have in the past, our record shows that we are frugal with our dollars and would continue to be so with any funds that we were hopefully given for that purpose. And maybe it'll be someone else. Mm -hmm. Because the other part of this is too, is that if there are other groups, other people, other citizens that come up with something that works, and whether it's another agency, another organization, or whatever that wants to run that great facility, I'm happy. Like we don't, we don't need to, we don't have to. We, you know, and if somebody else comes up with that, as long as it's being done, mm -hmm. that's all we care about. And again, I thank you for being the no. one who does say yes though, because so far it has been neighborhood work. So on behalf of, of everyone who appreciates what you do, um, thank you. Well, thank you. And thank you for being here today. Jim, come back anytime.
My guest today has been the Executive Director of Neighborhood Works, Jim Stewart. I'm Vicki Hogarth. Thank you for watching Southwest Magazine. Southwest Magazine is a news and public affairs production of CHCO Television.